Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we have three important papers in organic chemistry featuring SF2 and SF5 chemistry. To give you an overview, first we'll be talking about metal-mediated difluoromethylation reactions, followed by the discussion of metallophotoredox to install difluoromethyl groups, and finally we'll be reviewing SF5 chemistry, as this is an emerging motif in synthetic chemistry that that's typically a struggle for people to synthesize. The first paper for today involves metal-mediated difluoromethylation. This is a review article from 2016, and a lot of progress has been made in the field since then. Nonetheless, this still summarizes the majority of the ways that you can make difluoromethyl compounds. To give you a couple different ideas of what possible difluoromethylation reagents exist, here you can see the different ways that these compounds are typically accessed. Normally the metal that's used is either palladium, nickel, or copper, if you're trying to generate your traditional cross-coupling products. Although, if you use silver, it's possible to generate CF2H radicals and under photochemical conditions, achieve difluoromethylation. One example of metal-catalyzed difluoromethylation is the palladium-mediated difluoromethylation of aryl iodides and bromides. This can tolerate electron-poor and electron-rich aryans, as well as derivatives such as this shown here. This is how the authors made this compound, but I wonder if today's sponsor Reaxis has any alternative ideas about how we could make this. The way I like to build molecules is first I'll build it in ChemDraw, then I'll copy it over via a smile string and paste it into Reaxis. First we'll click on the Retrosynthesis tab and then we'll press Draw New Structure. From here we can paste in our smile string and it will generate the structure in Reaxis. Next we'll choose a predicted route. You can see that there's a lot of different options that you can vary, such as varying the number of reaction steps per project as well as the processing time, which can be standard or extended. Additionally, if you're working with a specific library of building blocks, you can ensure that the correct ones are selected here. The Retrosynthesis Planning Tool also now has an option for you to use a natural product-based library in your synthesis planning. We can remove any published routes so that we can just see the proposed routes that the Reaxis Retrosynthesis Planning Tool will show us. You can change the result of a prediction by playing with the diversity and selected building block categories. The Reaxis Retrosynthesis tool utilizes three neural networks trained on Reaxis data to generate synthesis plans. It breaks down product molecules into starting materials using extracted reaction rules, matching them against a library of building blocks. The algorithm iteratively resolves branches into available building blocks, displaying predicted reaction steps along with literature examples based on similarity scores to estimate feasibility. This can be a useful way for generating new ideas to help you along with your research. I'd like to thank Reaxis for their support of this channel. The downside is it requires palladium. Another palladium-mediated cross-coupling involves an umpalong reactivity where we have a boronic acid and instead ethyl bromodifluoroacetate. A whole slew of different reagents are required in order to get this reaction to work. In addition to palladium-mediated cross-coupling, nickel has been demonstrated for both aryl iodides as well as bromides. You can see that electron-rich arenes such as this methoxy and this terbutyl don't work as well, so it's possible that the chemistry might need to be modified to suit your specific substrate needs. This is typically the case in chemistry anyway, but I thought I'd state it here for newer chemists. In general, if you're doing chemistry, you're probably screening a bunch of different conditions, and the purpose of this chemistry is just to give you more options to screen. There's also a decent summary here showing that copper can mediate difluoromethylation. There's some examples from aryl and vinyl iodides. In addition, heteroaryl iodides with this CF2H tin reagent are able to occur, both from iodides and bromides, especially in the case of vinyl bromides. And copper-mediated difluoromethylation can also occur in the presence of TMS-CF2H on the bottom, as shown here, which is more or less similar to the conditions above, but a lot milder as this can occur at room temperature. The second paper for today involves metallophotoredox difluoromethylation. This isn't a review article, this is a research article discussing the metallophotoredox of aryl bromides, which enables access to difluoromethylarenes. The way that this reaction works is as follows. Initially, a bromine radical is able to abstract a hydrogen atom from tris trimethylsilyl silane. This then generates a silyl radical, which is able to abstract a bromine from bromodifluoromethane, generating a difluoromethyl radical. The nickel zero catalyst is then able to undergo an oxidative addition with aryl bromide 10, affording the nickel 2 complex 11. Once the difluoromethyl radical adds into the nickel 2 complex, a nickel 3 complex forms, and followed by reductive elimination, the nickel 3 is converted back to nickel 1, and the product is liberated as the difluoromethyl heteroarene. The nickel 1 complex is converted back into the nickel zero complex as the iridium is oxidized from iridium 2 to iridium 3. 
If you're wondering where the bromide radical from earlier comes from, when the excited iridium photocatalyst oxidizes bromide to bromine, the iridium-2 that's necessary to reduce the nickel is formed. So this is how the whole process gets a closed loop. To give you a snapshot of the scope, here's a few examples. This chemistry tends to tolerate a wide range of functional groups as it occurs under metallophotoredox conditions. Metallophotoredox, notoriously good at tolerating stuff. Especially if it's coming from the McMillan group, it would seem. The third and final paper for today is a review of SF5 chemistry and synthesis. The one thing I did want to mention before we start, though, is a number of SF5 building blocks are now commercially available, so you might not need to synthesize your building blocks, you might just have to do a little bit more searching to find some SF5 building blocks that you can buy. We'll start with the cornerstone reagent for SF5 chemistry. That's SF5Cl. SF5Cl can be made from elemental sulfur and potassium fluoride in the presence of trichloroisocyanuric acid. Because this affords a mixture of SF5Cl, sulfuryl fluoride, and sulfonyl fluoride, it's necessary to extract with hexane in order to get the desired product. SF5Cl can undergo chloropentafluorosulfonylation of alkenes as well as alkynes. You don't always want that chlorine there, so people have developed some chemistry to get rid of it, but there is established photochemistry to add SF5Cl to alkenes and alkynes. If you add this to an alkyne and you want to reduce it, you can use tris trimethylsilylsilane, that reagent that we also talked about earlier, and this adds in a hydrogen instead of your chlorine. Now, alternatively, if you're looking to make aryl SF5s, it's possible to use KF and TCCA to generate an aryl SF4Cl. However, that last chlorine needs to be substituted so that we can make our SF5 group. So historically, silver fluoride has been used, but a number of different reagents exist to do that halogen exchange. Other reagents include HF, zinc fluoride, IF5, antimony pentafluoride, silver tetrafluoroborate, potassium bifluoride, and HF pyridine. This isn't quite comprehensive, but it just goes to show you that you don't need silver fluoride, especially when anhydrous HF can be used. Although, if you're doing a laboratory synthesis, you might want to work with silver fluoride because it isn't HF and HF is a little bit scary. I'll include examples of these in the video description if you'd like to check them out. One example of silver tetrafluoroborate mediated exchange is shown here, where silver tetrafluoroborate is able to achieve this conversion from chloride to fluoride for a wide range of arenes as well as heteroarenes. Alternatively, you can do direct fluorination but be warned, if you do direct fluorination, you're going to start fluorinating the benzene ring, as shown here. This might not be a major issue if you're equipped to work with fluorine, but it's still undesirable to generate a wide range of fluorinated arene byproducts. Another cool thing that you can do with these is generate iodonium derivatives. Here's one example where this bromopyridine is first converted to this iodopyridine, and subsequently converted to this mesitylene iodonium-4 shown here. This can react with a number of different nucleophiles such as an amine, a parole, or a beta keto ester, or just a compound with a nucleophilic alpha position to install an entire aryl group, which is pretty cool. So if you aren't familiar with this hypervalent iodine chemistry, the mesitylene just blocks it so that the other aryl group migrates with preference. Overall, this is pretty cool, and this is a neat way to install SF5 building blocks into your molecules. You can also take SF5Cl in hexane and treat alpha diazo carbonyl compounds with it to install an alpha SF5 group. If you'd instead like to also add the chlorine, you can just change the conditions a little bit, and in the presence of copper, you'll instead retain the chlorine. If you instead want to take an existing SF5 arene and functionalize it, you can lithiate the ortho position using lithium TMP and add in your electrophile of choice. This then allows for subsequent functionalization. People have even explored SF5 derivatives of non-steroidal PR antagonists, where carburanes, both ortho and para, have been used. I thought that this was a little bit interesting because it has everything. It has SF5 groups, it has carburanes, and it has bioactivity, which is pretty interesting. One other interesting use of SF5 chemistry has been in the synthesis of this SF5 pyrazole. This is accomplished by taking SF5 ethylene, treating this with diazomethane, and subsequently oxidizing it to afford the corresponding SF5 pyrazole. This was then used for inorganic chemistry reasons, which I decided to include since I almost never include inorganic chemistry on this channel. But hey, I did talk about a lot of reductive eliminations in this video, so I don't think it's too bad. So in summary, there's a number of different ways to install CF2 groups via transition metal cross-coupling. It's also possible to use metallophotoredox if you're looking for even greater selectivity. Finally, there's a number of different ways to make SF5 containing building blocks in organic chemistry. Hopefully this video has helped teach you some more interesting ways to install fluorine into your molecules. I hope this has been helpful, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.